Ready? Yep. Okay, and action. Okay, um, my name is John Chapman. I'll do the whole thing again. Pediatrician here with James Project. I'm going to talk to you about pediatric allergy. Okay, kids with allergies. So this is where you are, in case you're a bit disorientated this morning. I run the allergy clinic. And we're talking about allergy because allergy is incredibly common. Um, you may have heard of this study a minute or two ago. Um, the Isaac study in the top left, um, which looks at um, children in the Aberdeen area. Um, and they found in this study from around 1996 um, that at least 50% of teenagers um, in that area have one or more atopic conditions. Atopic conditions being um, asthma, hay fever, or eczema. Um, a lot of these kids had allergic rhinitis, which is incredibly common in teenagers. Okay, now I'm talking about allergy because it's increasing. Again, this is old data, and it's carried on increasing since then. This is data going up to the millennium. Um, looking at, you might be able to read these boxes, but they're saying urticaria, atopic dermatitis, allergic rhinitis, food allergy, and asthma. I'll just highlight one of these for you, I think. Um, if you look at food allergy here, back in 1990, right at the bottom of the scale. Um, Ten years later, it's jumped um, to nearly halfway through as common as all the other diseases. So um, food allergy is um, big business and getting, getting bigger. Um, and it's increased since then. There's 14 years worth of increase since then. Here's some pictures. You can Google allergy or urticaria on the internet. And you can watch people sitting there um, on YouTube videoing, videoing themselves with their anaphylactic reactions. This guy sits there and says, I've just been out to a restaurant, I've just had some peanuts, look at my face. You know, ten minutes later, there he is, getting even worse. Um, why does he do something about it? I don't know. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about boring things like kids with runny noses. Because yeah, it's not that important, is it? A bit of hay fever. Um, actually, allergic rhinitis is incredibly important, particularly to teenagers, because they, they do lots of tests and stuff. Um, allergic rhinitis affects your quality of life. It's apparently um, affects your quality of life as much as having something like diabetes, although um, diabetes is often used as a benchmark for that. It affects your concentration because you can sleep well at night because your nose is blocked. Um, and there's an interesting study looking at children with allergic rhinitis who were sitting there mock exams. You might remember <coughs> some of those at kind of Christmas time. Um, and their final exams in the summer. Now you would hope you might get a bit better between your mock exams and your final exams. Um, kids with allergic rhinitis, because they're sitting their final exams in the middle of the pollen season, um, they have a higher risk of dropping a grade in their exams. So that kind of thing affects you for the rest of your life, really. There's one of my little patients. Um, again, you can Google uh, Yarmouth Mercury and read all about this chap. Um, the headline there is, Father's kissed nearly fatal for allergy boy. His dad had an egg sandwich, I think. Kissed him on his way out to work. And boy's face kind of blew up. So this is a dramatic little chap who gets quite significant allergies. Um, and you, you can follow his story through the Elmer's Mercury. He's in it quite a lot. Okay. Um, these are possibly the best um, documented medical notes you'll ever see um, from the middle of the bush in Zambia. I went to Zambia a couple of years ago. And even in Zambia, I can find kids with allergy. Um, this is a little chap. Um, who um, had a chronic history of asthma and allergic reactions, um, gets an attack every month whenever he goes near the goats. Um, if you go to Zambia, the goats just kind of wander through the village and that kind of thing. Um, all the goats poo. Um, so he's, he, he was very clearly um, asthmatic and we treated him with asthma medicine and we gave him some antihistamines because um, he can't avoid goats. So you can find allergy everywhere if you look hard enough. Here's a classification um, of uh, food hypersensitivity. There's various things in that. You get non-allergic food hypersensitivity. Um, I've got lactose intolerance there, um, problems with sulfites. Sometimes you get people have problems with alcohol as well. You get flushing. Um, they're all non-allergic. And um, under food allergies, you've got um, celiac disease in this classification. Now, normally I would put celiac disease in a different kind of group. I wouldn't, I wouldn't call that food allergy, but I can't really argue with. Um, with the classifiers. Um, and I'm really going to concentrate more on IgE mediated food allergy. Um, and the examples given there are milk, egg, and peanut. Um, 
But you can get a non-IG version of it that looks exactly the same. <laughs> For posterity, the recorder has been late. Okay. okay, so I'm going to give you a quick whiz through some immunology. Um, did I let you like near two in skin? No. Did anybody go to that? <laughs> Nobody remember that? I thought it was quite memorable. Yeah. Um, this is your immune system on a page. Um, the whole idea of the immune system is to find stuff that shouldn't be in your system and get rid of it. Um, this is the bit I'm interested in here. Type 1 hypersensitivity reaction. So you've got quick, acute inflammation. You've got a big chap in the middle there, the mast cell, um, and antibodies and stuff. Here's a close <coughs> of the mast cell. Um, I always think of the mast cell as being like a bouncer in a nightclub. You know a bouncer in a nightclub? Stands at the door, no hair, big shoulders. Um, doesn't say very much. Um, and that's what the mast cell does. Um, it's not really the brains of the operation. This chap here is the brain, it's a T helper cell. So he looks at allergens when they come in, he looks at proteins. You've got different proteins coming in your body all the time, especially if you're a little baby, because um, everything is new to you and you need to check out everything. So um, your T helper cell has a look at it and it decides on a variety of criteria whether it's bothered about it or not. Um, and if it decides, well, I'm really quite upset about this, it takes a picture of it. Okay? Um, and along with its B cell there, it produces an IgE, which is a picture of this um, allergen that it decided not to like. And it gives that picture to the bouncer. Okay? And he stands there and he says, you come back again, you're not getting it. Yeah. Um, so he stands and waits and he's absolutely fine. The next time the bit of peanut or whatever it is comes in, meets the mast cell, here's a look at it. Um, the allergen crosses two of these IgE cells and bang, okay. there's no chat with a bouncer. Okay. One minute you're happy, next minute he's got you by the collar and he's chucking you out the door. Um, and that's what the mast cell does, it just pours out all his chemicals. Um, lots of different chemicals come flooding out, uh, histamines and all sorts of stuff. Um, and that causes lots of damage around, it causes swelling, um, edema, flushing, bronchoconstriction, depends where it is. If it's on your skin you'll get great big wheels or to carry on your skin, if it's your nose, you've got nasal swelling and a lot of fluid. So that's the mast cell. This is what a real mast cell looks like. It's just stuffed full of chemicals. It's got no other purpose. It's just a, um, a little bomb, really. Okay, so these are supposed to be the clever ones, the T helper cells. And you have two populations of T helper cells, T1, T2. Um, T1 helper cells are supposed to help you fight off infections. Um, if you have lots of infections to fight off, they're really kind of the big, busy bunch, um, and they suppress your allergic reactions. Um, and then you get the T helper 2 cells. And if you don't have enough stimulation on your T helper 1 side, then you'll stop producing as many T helper 1s and you'll produce more T helper 2s. T helper 2s um, produce IgE, they wind up the mast cell, um, and they produce cytokines and stuff that um, affect allergic diseases. So, if you have too much T helper 2 activity, you're more likely to have um, allergic disease. Obviously, this is a bit simplistic. Um, often, there's kind of showing a bit of seesaw, and it kind of tips one way or tips the other. Um, but you can you can have diseases in in both categories of leukemia. Okay, let's talk about clean versus dirty. Okay, you've heard of the hygiene hypothesis. It's a big big deal. It's blamed for everything. Um, nowadays, I was at a lecture last night. Anybody here at the Paget lecture last night? No, good. Um, <laughs> and, and there was a, um, a chap there who was talking about Crohn's disease and how that's related to the hygiene hypothesis as well. And everything he said about Crohn's, you could just take out the word Crohn's and insert the word allergy. So, um, we're all too clean. We don't have enough dirt in our diet and in our lives. Um, because of improvements in sanitation, immunization, hygiene, um, use of antibiotics, etc. If you don't have enough bacteria around, um, your T helper ones um, don't have enough to do, um, so your T helper twos proliferate. Lots and lots of evidence for this. Um, if you have a dirty upbringing, I'll explain what I mean by a dirty upbringing, you're less likely to be allergic. So, um, anybody here brought up on a farm? No? 
and farmers children here. Okay. Um, farm nice house surrounded by poo. Yeah, and that's that's what farms are. Um, farmers children have less allergy than the general population because they're brought up with poo. Um, if you're brought up with a dog, you're less likely to have asthma because dogs are inherently dirty. Dog will come along, it'll lick its bottom, it'll lick your hand, mm. lick another dog's bottom, lick your face. Mm. And if you live with a dog, you're sharing your bacteria um, with your dog. Um, it, it, in the same way that farmers' children do with, with all their animals. Um, very interesting work done looking at Germany after reunification. So you had Germany, you had, it's almost like a perfect study, you got a whole country and you split it in half. And so you had two cohorts for um, for kind of 30, 40 years, um, and you gave them very different lifestyles. So you had West Germany, as it, as it says, a very kind of Western lifestyle, and East Germany, um, a communist lifestyle. Um, East Germany had allergy rates, no real problem at all, very flat. West Germany had allergy rates rocketing, the same as the rest of Western Europe. Um, and then you do a crossover almost, where you unzip the country and let everybody kind of come up to um, West German, Western standards. Um, and the East German allergy rates rocket to catch up with West Germany. So it's a lifestyle disease. It's all about lifestyle. Um, there's a degree of um, genetics in it, but um, a huge amount of lifestyle. Um, and they first noticed this in sibling numbers, when people used to have big families of five or six children, um, and the first child had more allergies than the last child. And the theory goes that the first child comes along, young parents, keep this child nice and clean, keep it off the ground. Oh, God, there's our second child. We're like, what are we going to do? We're going to put put number one down and pick number two up and put number two down and child number two spends more time on the floor getting stuff done to it by child number one and the dog and everything else. And by the time you get to child three, number one's at school, bringing all the infections back and the whole thing kind of goes on and on. So you get down the family and by the time you get to number five, you know, they've, they've had it and they've just got to fend for themselves. Um, so they're much less likely to have allergies. But we don't want to die from infections, so that's good. Um, now, if you read the title of this paper, would you delve into it or would you just skim past it? It's not the most exciting um, title, um, unless you're a bit of an allergy geek. Um, and what this says is, um, kids who are allergic have got a lower variety of bacteria and stuff in their guts. So it's not about the actual numbers, um, it's about the diversity. So you need a lot of different bacteria. Um, in your gut. And interestingly, it was um, a very similar talk um, to Crohn's disease last night. It's all about um, reduced biodiversity in your intestinal microbiome top. Um, so, you know, taking Yakult in the morning might take your bacteria from 100 to 101, and you need to take it from 100 to um, a couple of thousand different types of bacteria. So you need to take a mixture of stuff. Um, which is why people are starting to talk about fecal transplantation. You know about fecal transplantation? Yeah. You get someone else's poo and stick it in a blender and blend it down and inject it up your bum. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it, it works for C. diff infections. Um, and then you know, when you start to find these diseases that are characterized by reduced variety of microbacteria in your gut, you start to think, you know, is it going to work for allergies and Crohn's disease? I don't think anyone's done a, um, a proper clinical trial yet. But, um, they are kind of talking about it. Okay, so going back to allergies, when does it all start? <coughs> um, it probably starts in utero. Uh, sad man that I am, I was reading a paper this morning while I was having my breakfast, um, talking about um, cord IgE levels. So these babies are born, and from your cord IgE level and your family history, you can make a prediction about how likely you are to be allergic. So you know, you're born and it's, it's tough, it's done already, um, to a certain degree. Um, a, a lot of it starts in early infancy, and I'll come on to that um, on another slide. Um, but it can start at any time. You, know, you can all of a sudden, in your teens, become being allergic, or in your 20s, become allergic to something else. And it, it changes all the time, and we'll do that in a minute. Okay, again, um, fantastic <coughs> study, um, not the most exciting title. Um, this is a study on Bangladeshi ladies and girls. So what they looked at was um, ladies from Bangladesh, so over there, well, at the age of over 15, say, um, who come from Bangladesh um, over the age of 15. They have 
an asthma prevalence of 6.5, which is the same as Bangladesh, not very surprising. Um, if, you're, if they go on to have family, so children born to Bangladeshi parents in the UK, um, have an asthma prevalence of 16, so that's a big jump. So that's not a genetic change. That's nothing to genetics. You know, it's the same genes, the same Bangladeshi genes passing through. So something happens to these kids that are born in the UK um, to give them two, two and a half times the risk of getting asthma. Um, and then if you look at the group in between, the group that are brought to the UK in the, in the first four years as small children, um, they've got the same rate of asthma as the UK kids. So being brought to the UK before the age of four um, does something to you. So we do something to our kids, presumably all the kids, not just the Bangladeshi kids, in the first four years that makes them have more asthma. Something about the UK, or the UK diet, um, or just our lifestyle um, that gives these kids more asthma. Because if you come after the age of five, then you're set. And you're, your prevalence for um, asthma is the same as it was in Bangladesh. Okay. Um, a few years ago, we used to advise pregnant women to avoid peanuts. Because we thought peanuts are bad. Um, you shouldn't have them because you your kids might be allergic. Um, the things you need to know is you, if, if you've never been exposed to it, if your T cells have never seen that allergen, you're probably never going to be allergic to it unless it looks like something else. Um, so if you manage to find a protein on that comet that's whizzing round and brought it back to Earth, you, know, you shouldn't be allergic to it the first time. Um, and then one problem is if you try and avoid something completely, you might end up just being exposed to a tiny amount of it. Um, and that might be even worse, because it might be if you, for example, with peanuts, if you eat a Snickers bar every five minutes, um, when, when you're pregnant, then your baby's flooded with peanut, and probably it's going to come out, it's not going to be bothered about peanut. Um, they did a study in Manchester, um, looking at house dust mite um, in asthma. Um, and their theory was, if we find children with asthma, whose moms are pregnant with their second child, and we go around to their house, we wipe out all the houses mite in the house. You know, we steam clean all the carpets, all the furnishings, we spray everything with house dust mite killer um, and prove that we've reduced the level of house dust mite, which they did, and the second child will have less asthma. And it turned out in the study the second child had more asthma because they reduced it, but they didn't get rid of it completely. And presumably just dropping it down to a small amount, when that bit of house dust mite got into the baby, it thought, mm, this is funny stuff. You know, mum's not eating much of this. Um, maybe it's bad, and then they become sensitised to it. <coughs> um, and if you're exposed to a large amount of allergen, then your body might give up reacting. You may have heard of the peanut studies that are going on in Cambridge now, um, where they get peanut allergic children, and they're feeding them peanut. Small amounts, and then a bit more, a bit more, a bit more, until eventually um, they're not allergic anymore. So you can desensitise yourself by having large amounts of stuff. Sometimes it takes a long time, sometimes you can do it in a day. So at the moment, for pregnant women, we don't give any advice at all. Pregnant women should eat whatever they fancy, except for soft shoes. Okay. I said that allergies change all the time. We said that you're born to be an allergic person. So this is what we call the, um, the atopic march or the allergic march. <clears throat> this is what little children do. So imagine a small child, born to be atopic, um, pops out of mum, um, then gets fed cow's milk. Okay, all of a sudden, he's flooded with this foreign protein um, in his gut, um, and he develops an allergy to it. So food allergy is the first thing kiddies get. If you look at the area under the curve, you get a huge amount of food allergy in the first few years, so milk, egg, peanut. Um, and that kind of fades away into adulthood. So lots of kids with food allergy, not very many adults with food allergy. I'm sure I'll find one in the room, but I'll leave that for now. Um, and then shortly after that, you get a peak in eczema. So these kids might miss out the food allergy and go straight to eczema, or they might do food allergy and eczema. Um, and you get a peak of that around the age of one, and again, that fades away. Lots of kids with eczema, not so many adults with eczema. And then you get asthma later on. Um, again, asthma is impossible in small babies, um, but very common at the age of about seven. Um, fades away, not as much as food allergy, and things fade away, so you get more adults with asthma than you will 
um, with food allergy. And here's rhinitis, okay, allergic rhinitis, snot, sniffy, snotty children, going up to teenage there, very incognito small babies, and just gets more and more and more and more prevalent um, until it gets to your teens. You remember going back to one of the first slides saying that 50% of um, teenagers will have a degree of allergic rhinitis. So that's kind of career or march that these kids will do from one thing to the next. Sometimes they'll just do one, sometimes they'll do all four. Okay, and if we have a look at this rather complicated um, slide, I just want to show you a couple of bits on it. Um, so this is a study done with children um, with eczema, so atopic dermatitis. Um, and if you look at this group here, um, they're children who are not um, giving any, any treatment at all, so it's a placebo group. So this is what happens to children with eczema um, who also have grass pollen allergy. So you get your kids with grass pollen allergy, um, and eczema, and you watch them for three years and see if they develop asthma. Obviously, at the beginning of the trial, nobody's got asthma because that's one of your exclusion criteria. And you watch them for the next three years, and in that group, these um, kids with eczema and allergy, all of a sudden, one after another, start to develop asthma within three years until you get to about 95%. So if you find a small child with eczema and an allergy, in this case, grass pollen, but it goes with other allergies, you can say, with your crystal ball, within three years, 95% um, chance this child's going to get asthma. So one thing just follows the other. Okay, let's talk about food allergies. Not food intolerance, not lactose intolerance, which I don't believe exists. Just throw that one in. Um, <laughs> very common in children, less common in adults. It doesn't exist. It's, it's a marketing ploy. Um, so, top four. Um, food allergies. Number one, cow's milk. Number two, egg white, not egg yolk, egg white. Number three, peanut. And number four, cod. If you look for it, you'll find cod. Um, between those four, they account for about 89% of all food allergies. So if I see a child that I really haven't got a clue what the problem is, they're going to be on my screen for these kids. And if we extend it beyond the top four, um, you find the next ones on the list are soya um, and wheat, and that's IgE mediated wheat allergy, not seen out disease because that's a different process, um, and cashew nut coming up on the rails. Um, and obviously, this will change with, with what we eat. Um, when I was growing up, we didn't have cashew nuts, so cashew nuts. whereas now you can, you can pick them up anyway. Okay, I did this talk one time to some GPs and um, I, I decided to look back over the previous three weeks to see what I'd seen in clinic. Um, and these are the, this is the variety of um, allergies that we um, found on screen for testing in clinic. So these were kind of genuine allergies. So banana, peanut, kiwi, egg, walnut, hazelnut, soya, wheat, hazelnut, almond, and then a whole load of airborne allergens as well. So house dust mite, cat, dog, horse, pollens, and alternaria, which is the mold. So a huge spread of different different allergies in different patients, sometimes in the same patient. Okay, and when you go shopping this weekend, we've got food in this weekend, now you're going to shopping, okay. Have a look on the label, um, and this is what must be declared on food that's sold in Europe. So this, this is the um, European directive list. Um, we haven't pulled out of Europe yet, have we? We're we still in? Still in. So milk, eggs, um, cereals with gluten in them, peanuts, all nuts, fish, soya, sesame, crustaceans, mollusks, and crabs and mussels and that kind of thing. Celery. Why would you eat celery anyway? It's a of celery. Um, but you can be allergic to celery. It's a bit of a continental thing. Mustard, lupins. Anyone here eat lupins? Anyone know what a lupin is? Like a foxglove, similar. Um, in the UK, we grow lupins as flowers. On the continent, we grow lupins as a seed. It's like a pulse. Um, and if you ever see a, a lupin <coughs> flower, when it dies, it has a little pod on it. Anything that comes in a pod is a legume. Um, so lupin is a legume. Um, soya, where's soya? Soya bean, it's a bean, it's a legume. And, and peanut comes in a pod. So it comes as monkey nuts, or ground nut. Um, again, so that's a legume. So there's three different legumes on the list, and sulfur dioxide, which is not an allergy. 
Okay, and we talked about the allergic march in general. This is what happens to kiddies with food. They have to run a, a very similar pattern. So the first thing you're allergic to is the first thing you're exposed to. So cow's milk, assuming that you are um, bottle fed. Most kids don't get egg until a year, because that's the governmental advice. Um, and then so at the age of a year, everyone starts giving their kids scrambled egg, and some of them get reactions, so you get a peak of egg allergy. Um, but if you look, these allergies disappear completely. So milk allergy should be gone by the time you're six, seven, and um, probably before that. Um, egg allergy should be gone by the time you're nine, ten. So I, I can say to most parents who come in, their child's got milk allergy or egg allergy, come to your time, they'll be gone, you'll be absolutely fine. Peanut's slightly different. Um, there's only about 30% of people who develop peanut allergy that actually grow out of it. Um, there's different varieties of peanut allergy, some are more serious than others. Okay, we talked a bit about cross reactions, we talked about pulses, legumes, um, so anything that's in the same family. So you get anything that comes in a pod, so peanuts and peas. I was telling parents that peanuts are half pea and half nut, clues in the name. Um, some people would be peanut allergic and tree nut allergic, um, or they'd be peanut allergic and pea, like legume allergic, so beans, um, lentils, chickpeas, that kind of thing. Or sometimes it's just a weird, random association. So, um, egg and peanut are a common combination. Milk and soya are a common combination. One's from a cow and one's from a bean. Um, egg yolk and bird feathers. Okay, you could argue that an egg yolk grows up to be a bird feather. Egg yolk's quite, quite an unusual allergy. Um, so if you find one that's feather allergic, you need to check them for egg yolk as well. Um, kiwi, banana, latex, avocado, melon, all kind of go together as a little, a little group. Um, and sometimes they're part of a pollen fruit syndrome. But the commonest pollen fruit syndrome is um, birch and apple. Anybody here got bad hay fever? Not today, obviously, because it's... Um, lots of adults, teenagers with bad hay fever, will struggle with fruit. They struggle with particularly apples. Um, and when they bite an apple, they will get an allergic reaction in their mouths. Sometimes they'll feel a bit of um, tightness and a bit of indigestion. Um, because um, if you think about kind of how you build an apple, you build it from plant proteins. And one of the plant proteins you use is, always, is also used to build pollens. So in the springtime, when the tree pollen is out, sometimes it's grass pollen as well, but often it's a birch tree pollen, um, your body is allergic to a particular protein in um, the pollen. And that protein is also found in the skin of apples. So when you eat a fresh apple, you can have an allergic reaction to it. Um, sometimes just in the season, so people get very confused because they're, they're only allergic to apples in the months of, um, kind of February up to um, July. You want to ask me a question? Yeah, um, with cow's milk protein allergies, um, people generally drink milk from animals like goats and things like that, or are they...? Goats, no. Goats are incredibly similar to cows, and the, the protein is almost exactly the same. Okay. Um, you're not going to ask me about camels, are you? No. No, okay. Um, people do ask me about camels, you know. What about camel milk? I don't know about camel milk. <laughs> well, why would I know about camel milk? You, you can buy camel milk um, on, on eBay. You can get it in tins. Um, I have absolutely no idea. I suspect you might be alright, but I'm not sure you'd want to drink it. Um, so, um, here's some aero allergens for you. Um, the grass is pretty clear, that's pollen. We've got cats down here. What are you allergic to with cats? What's dander? Saliva. Saliva, yeah. So cats are very clean, as opposed to dogs are very dirty, cats are very clean. They lick themselves all the time, um, and they are covered in a layer of their own saliva, um, which dries up um, and flakes off, and I guess that's probably the cat dander. Um, so you, if you're allergic to cat, you're allergic to cat spit. So um, if you buy a bald cat, you get a Devon Rex, which is a bald cat, it will still lick itself all over and be covered with its own spit. Um, if you wash your cat weekly, you will get all that off. It will probably shred you with its nails, but uh, you can make a cat less allergenic by washing it. Um, mushrooms, fungi, spores, you can make those spores, there's a whole list of different fungi and mold that can do it. And then on the top right, 
What's that? A house does light. Just like a crab, doesn't it? Actually, they have the same muscles in them as crabs. And some people who are house does light allergic have problems eating crab. And what are you allergic to with house does light? House does light poop. Okay, so here's, here's my little house does light friend here. Um, this is family sitting down for Sunday lunch, and that's one of your skin cells. They come along, they find a skin cell, ooh, live, living in the carpet here, billions of them, and they go munch munch, they eat your skin cells, passes through their gut, picks up their gut enzymes, and then they do a poo, and their poo's got their gut enzymes. The poo dries up, blows around, you breathe it in, it's like the circle of life, isn't it? Um, and you're allergic to the gut enzymes of house dust mites held in their poo. Because you have to be allergic to a protein, so an enzyme is a, um, a perfect protein to be allergic to. We go back up to this chap. He's got a funny old mouth, hasn't he? He can probably munch away with that. How's he going to drink? Bear in mind the shape of his mouth and his size. Trick question, because he can't drink, he's too small. If he came across water, or even a drop of water would drown in it. Um, He's all wrinkly. Um, he takes water in through his skin. So he has to have water vapor, it has to be in a moist environment to survive. Um, so you kill these little beasts by drying them out. Um, and you dry them out um, usually by dropping the temperature. When you drop the temperature, there's less humidity in the air, there's less liquid for them to pull in, um, so it kills them or it inhibits their reproduction. So um, you may have seen um, programs on TV when they're trying to sort out kids' asthma and say to them, don't make your bed in the morning. This house just might loves to be in bed with you. It likes, it likes the mattress, it likes the duvet, it loves the pillows, and it's warm and moist inside the bed. So if you get up in the morning and just chuck your duvet, let your duvet cool down, and your bed cool down and dry out, and these chaps won't, won't like it so much. Um, if you go up a mountain, when you go up a mountain, it gets colder and colder, and it gets to a certain point where a house just might can't live anymore. So like a mountain might have a snow line, it will also have an invisible house just might line on it. You're going to live in a desert, uh, you won't find any house to smite. Interestingly, kids that have asthma in the UK are often sensitised to house to smite. If you have <coughs> asthma um, in Arizona, in the desert, you're sensitised to alternaria just as badly as they are in the UK. So kids with asthma are going to get sensitised to something that's around. There we go. Okay, <coughs> now which is the seasonal. So you'll get um, house to smite all year round, but usually worse in the winter when you're stuck inside and the central heating's on and the windows are shut. You get pollens through the summertime and you get molds in the, at the end of the summer. Um, and different pollens will come out at different times. And you will find people who are just allergic to one specific type of pollen. So it might just be grass pollen allergic. And they'll have a problem in June and July and be fine the rest of the year. Or people who are just birch pollen. Um, but when you go back to the UEA, when the busman, what's his driving you know, if the busman lets you on, um, you have a look at the side of the road and it'll be lined with silver birch trees. Okay. Um, and they're all male silver birch because they look nice. They're really cheap trees. Um, and if you look at them um, after Christmas, you'll see lots of catkins hanging off the like male trees. And they just pour out pollen. That's what they do. Um, and they are exactly the worst tree to have around students. So that's it. Because they're cheap, that's what they do. Um, weeds tend to come out later in the summer when everyone's bored with gardening and uh, the spores are the same when everything's dying off at the end of the year. Okay, you still know where you are? Yeah? Good. Oh, that's boring, that's too, too boring, too boring. That's just about me, that's boring, that's boring. Boring. Okay, um, this is how we do our testing. We do skin prick testing. So, um, we can do that in two ways. Uh, we either have um, Kind of a made-up vial, so we have a made-up vial of cat. Um, it's not got a real cat in it, it's just got some dissolved cat spit in it. I have had people bring me genuine fresh horse spit. Have you ever seen horse spit? That's not very nice. She brought me some horse spit in a, in a tub. Um, but we tend to use these standardised allergens. Um, if we're doing milk, we will use milk. That's, that's fine. Um, and if we're doing fruit, we will do a prick prick test. We'll get a little needle stick it in the apple and then stick it in the patient. So what you do is you put a little blob of liquid on the arm, 
um, and you get a fresh needle every time and you make a tiny little hole in the skin. Um, this, it's not painful unless you get your finger in the way. Um, and the patients will usually tolerate quite a bit of it. And then you wait for about 10, 15 minutes and wait for that type 1 sensitivity reaction so you get a little bump like you've been poked with a stinging nettle that you're allergic to. You can't really see it on there, but that one's actually come up quite, quite nicely. Yeah, we have a selection of fruit and stuff in the clinic. Sometimes people would bring their own stuff. I've got someone that's um, going to bring me a fresh peach in, in March next year because he was negative to our test for peach, but we thought we'd retest him for a fresh peach. Okay, and let's say you're allergic to milk. You know, first thing to do is we say, don't eat milk. Yeah, seems quite straightforward, doesn't it? Just go out and don't eat milk, or anything that contains milk. Um, and here's one of the uh, UK um, leaflets. There's loads of stuff on there you've got to try and avoid. The problem is it doesn't always say milk. So it might say casein, or hydrolyzed casein, or caseinates, and you have to know that that's milk. Um, it might say whey syrup sweetener, which will be milk. Um, or it might just say whey on it. And here's a list from the bottom of the whole um, bunch of things that have got milk in that maybe you didn't think would have milk in them, like uh, soup or meat, processed meat, um, gravy, um, crisps are often sprayed in, in milk as well. Um, kids will have allergic reactions to the wrong kind of crisps. So it can be a bit of a nightmare trying to avoid stuff. So, your plan if you're allergic to something, number one, don't eat it, don't go near it, don't ride on it, it's a big thing. Second thing, take some antihistamine. If you have any reaction, take some uh, chlorphenamine or loratadine or cetirizine. It really doesn't matter, they're all probably as good as each other. Um, they all work pretty quickly, within about 10, 20 minutes. Um, and a good dose, I'm talking about kind of swigging the stuff out of the bottle of this liquid, um, will um, stop your allergic reaction pretty quickly. Hopefully stop you needing anything else. Um, one of the dangerous things about allergic attacks is that sometimes they set off your asthma as well. And if you're one of these kids that has asthma and allergies, um, people that die from allergies often die from a combination of allergy and asthma. So um, if you have asthma as well, you need to start taking your bronchodilators or your salbutamol. Um, and start taking that before you start to get tired. <coughs> You don't better in five minutes, but you're still okay. You take some more antihistamine and some more bronchodilator. Um, <clears throat> and if you're not well after kind of 10, 20 minutes, or you're getting worse, um, or you find someone collapsed and they're wearing an allergy band or an allergy medic alert, look for their adrenaline auto injector. I guess I should probably call it an epinephrine auto injector. And um, it might be an EpiPen, it might be an Amapen, or that's unusual now. Um, it might be a Jext pen. It might be an emeraid pen. They're all slightly different. Um, they all have a, a similar kind of um, style where you take a cap off one end and then whack the patient with the other. They usually have instructions written on the side. Um, one of them actually speaks to you. Um, I don't know if that's out in the UK yet. It's an American thing, but um, if you press a button and it says, remove grey cap, and then you hit the patient with it. Um, Things you need to know about adrenaline auto injectors is they are they usually come in two sizes. And one of them comes in three sizes. Um, you have to be over 15 kilos to use them, so you have to be reasonably big. Um, so you need to know the patient's weight. Um, you need to give it into a muscle, um, usually the outer thigh. Um, you can give it through clothes because it was designed by the U.S. military for battlefield use. So. Um, designed to go through kind of combat fatigue, so it will go through just about anything. Just make sure you're holding it the right way around, because if you hold it the wrong way around and you put your thumb on the needle, you will inject your thumb with adrenaline, and the adrenaline will basically constrict your thumb, your thumb will go black and drop off, and the person that's waiting for the adrenaline will probably die from the other person. So that's not very good. Um, lots of people nowadays will have two. The current advice is if you have two with you, one in case somebody that sticks the first one in their thumb, um, and um, two, in case you, you take one um, and you're still not any better by the time you get to the hospital and, and the ambulance team have got another one to give you. The current recommendation is that everyone has two just in case. Most people never use them. Um, they're just there for insurance, they hang around in, in mum's handbag for about 18 months, they go out of date and then they get a new one. What you must do is seek medical help because the adrenaline 
will make you well for about 20, 30 minutes, and then you'll start to get worse again because your allergic reaction will last for a couple of hours. Um, so you must get yourself to hospital. And with children, you need to make sure that everyone else is around, parents, both parents, separated parents, grandparents, um, and the teachers, um, and the Cub Scout leader, and the football chap that takes them off on a Saturday, all need to know how to use the pens. Um, and I have the nurses who will do all that training. This is what one of them looks like. This is an old-fashioned EpiPen with a needle out of the end. Um, one of the newer um, adrenaline auto-injectors <coughs> has a longer needle because um, people are getting a bit fatter. So if, you have, um, if you've got a slightly larger patient, um, then you give the one with a slightly longer needle to get through the fat into the muscle. Um, we don't give everybody an EpiPen. This is the kind of criteria that we use. Um, so first of all, you grade their reaction. And, you know, if redness and urticaria, okay, grade one. Um, generalized urticaria, that's still only grade two. I'm not worried about that much. Um, a bit of vomiting and a runny nose, okay, all those are classed as mild. Um, we don't start getting worried and they get a moderate reaction, so they get some kind of airway type problem. So the change in their voice suggests a laryngeal change, feeling of tightening in their throat, um, mild asthma, um, would all kind of class as a, a grade four, and then you get severe, clear anaphylactic reactions, which is dyspnea, collapse, loss of consciousness. Um, so if you're in the M2 categories, yes, you should have an EpiPen. You'll never use it, hopefully, because most people just react the first time, and once they know they're going to have a monster reaction like this, they don't do it again. Um, so they can have it. Um, anybody who's got an allergy, significant allergy, um, and asthma should have it. So I'm talking about you know, if you've got a peanut allergy, um, you'd want to have an EpiPen. And if you have any reaction, um, we just trigger off by a trace. By a trace reaction, and you might consider the young chap that was kissed by his dad, and his dad had eaten an egg, um, as a kind of trace reaction. Um, some people with fish allergy will react when they walk past the fish and chip shop, the fish and chip shop's cooking. You know, you can smell the fish coming out. That smell is fish protein, it's aerosolized coming out. And some people will react to that. I've had patients that react to boil, someone boiling an egg on the other side of the house, and will get me to carry it. Um, so if you've got that kind of extreme reaction, we'd usually give you an epipen. <coughs> okay, here's how to use an EpiPen or a Inject Pen. Take off the cap, inject it into the patient's outer thigh. There is a story, I don't know if it's true, of a teacher who was taught like this who took the cap off from the child's reaction and they injected themselves because that's how they were trained to do it, just like to autopilot. Make sure you inject it um, into the child's outer thigh. We've changed our training so we now teach people to inject it into somebody else's thigh. Anything that can possibly go wrong will go wrong. And when it's in, you hold it for 10 seconds to make sure that all the fluid has got through the syringe into the patient, and then you rub the muscle. Because epinephrine, adrenaline, is a vasoconstrictor. You put it on the muscle, you constrict it, all the blood vessels, it's not going anywhere. So you have to massage the muscle to get all this drug leaving and into their system. But it's just as good as giving an epinephrine. And you can go online and watch um, how to um, inject it online, you can download it on your mobile phone, you can do the whole thing. <coughs> okay, so we talked a bit about this before, you saw that funny little picture, um, talking about kids with, with eczema and allergies, so eczema and grass pollen allergy or eczema and egg allergy, having a 90% risk of developing asthma. So if you have eczema, you get a 50% risk of getting asthma later on. Um, if you have a runny nose, you get a 50% chance of getting asthma later on. Um, if you're treated with desensitization, you cut your risk. So again, we could um, reduce the number of um, adult asthmatics that we have by treating children with allergies with desensitization. So you might have desensitization as an injection. Um, so we might put a polynex injection where you get injected against um, grass pollen. Um, or you can have sublingual tablets against grass pollen as well. And I think they're bringing out a house just my version. And they're not currently licensed or available on the NHS. Okay, and sometimes we do food challenges which sound really exciting but are actually really, really boring. Um, the gold standard would be a double blind placebo controlled food challenge, um, but um, you wouldn't ever do that. 
um, what we do is we bring the child in, and if they're milk allergic, um, we'll bring them in and we'll touch some of the bit of milk on the back of their hand. If they get rags on the back of their hand, we're not going to feed them milk, we're going to send them home. Um, then you touch them on their lip, because that's where your gut starts. And then you put a drop on their tongue, and then you might give them two and a half mils, then you might give them five mils, and eventually, through the morning, um, they will drink a significant amount of milk. And you do the same for peanut, kind of building it up. Um, we'll do the same for um, egg. Um, and if they eat it at the end of it, and they're fine for the next couple of days, then they're not allergic, and they can put it back into their diet. Um, I have had patients who come and sit in the car park and feed their kids a Snickers bar, which is really not very sensible. Um, and I had one chap referred to me by a dermatologist, you can tell from his lecture, he was rather upset. Um, he'd seen this child in clinic um, for his eczema, and the parents said, oh, we think he's allergic to peanuts. Um, and he said, oh, well, I'll, I'll do a blood test. So he did a blood test, blood test came back, so I went back again and said, no, the blood test is fine, it's, neg it's negative, he's not allergic to peanut. First of all, skin tests are not perfect, blood tests are not perfect. The best judge of whether someone's allergic is to feed them it or to go on the history. So the parents were a bit miffed, and when they came back the third time to the dermatology clinic, they fed him peanuts in the waiting room. So by the time he got in to see the dermatologist, he was a big swollen mess. The dermatologist was a bit, a bit moody. Um, so, um, nice, safe food challenges in hospital. This is just to remind me to say that I've probably been talking quite simplistically about allergies. It's kind of like allergic person plus what they're allergic to equals allergy. And it's not always like that. Um, sometimes um, we change our bodies by um, exercising. We change the temperature in our body, we change the way our body works. The same thing happens when you're on well. And you might be the kind of person who is absolutely fine eating stuff when you're, when you're well. Um, but when, you're, when you've got fever or you've just been exercising, um, you can have a reaction to it. And some people will get specific exercise induced allergies, so um, particularly against wheat, but actually there's a whole bunch of foods that can do it. Um, whereby you know, they eat toast for breakfast every single day, you know, and they've got a routine, they have the toast, they go and get to the bus, they go to work, they come back. Um, and one day, you know, they eat their toast and they get delayed and they have to run for the bus. And they run for the bus and they collapse and they eat because they've got exercise induced allergy or exercise induced anaphylaxis to wheat um, and the exercise too close to it. That's not the end of my talk unfortunately for you. It's just so big that I can't get it all on one screen.